Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another uh, episode of In Conversation Live from the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm Roger Kirby, the current president uh, of the RSM, and uh, you're all very welcome uh, this evening. Tonight's guest is a uh, very famous uh, uh, clinician, surgeon, and uh, member of the House of Lords, Bernie Ribeiro, Baron Ribeiro, CBE, FRCS. Um, Bernie was qualified at the Middlesex Hospital, like me, um, in uh, a little bit earlier than me, actually 1967. And he became a consultant general surgeon with a special interest in both urology and colorectal surgery in Basildon Hospital, uh, Essex. And there he introduced minimally invasive surgery using uh, uh, laps, laparoscopy. He's been an examiner for, the, for surgery at the Royal College of Surgeons. And he was in 2004, he was awarded a CBE for services to medicine. Uh, he's president uh, of the Association of Surgeons from 1999 to 2000, and president of the Royal College of Surgeons from 2005 to 2008. Uh, in uh, 2010, he was appointed Lord Ribeiro of Achimoto in the Republic of Ghana and of Ovington in the county of Hampshire. Bernie, you are very welcome. You and I have known each other for a long time, so it's especially nice to be able to talk to you this evening. You're very welcome. Uh, we will, we're open to questions, so if people would like to ask Bernie, um, I'm going to refer to you as Bernie, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, ask Bernie any questions, then please do send them in. Bernie, let, let's start at the beginning. And, and uh, you know, I know you've got this interesting story of coming across to the UK aged eight. So th th I say this program is a bit like Desert Island Discs without the music. <laughs> so let, let's start at the beginning. And, and what are your first memories of arriving from Ghana in the, in the UK? Yeah, quite striking, Roger, really, because I was only eight, as you said. And... Uh, uh, we left uh, the Gold Coast, as it was then, in 1952, on a, a ship called the Apapa, uh, of the Elder Dempster Line. And uh, I had visions as we came across uh, from um, the Gold Coast uh, around Sierra Leone and then through uh, the rough uh, seas, as you do, to England. And um, obviously the temperature changed. We were actually arrived in, in, in uh, June, but it still felt jolly cold. And my one vision I had uh, of watching my father's car being uh, lifted out of the hold and then appearing on the side of the docks. And then we all piled in and, you know, got onto the train uh, and, and came to London. <laughs> so the youngest of five kids and your father was a, was a teacher, but he, he was an inspiration to you, is that right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that um, any African who can get a good education uh, will go a long way. And it was one of father's big mantra that, you know, if you're educated, then the world's your oyster. And he was very lucky. He, he started off as, as a, um, a teacher um, in, in various schools. Uh, and he uh, actually started with a new school in, in 1924 was founded by uh, the Prince of Wales, and that was called Achimota, uh, which was quite near Accra. And, and this is an interesting uh, school because it had a, this school, uh, his motto, Ut Omnis Unum Sint, meaning that all may be one. And the symbol was the piano keys. And Person Agre, who set up this school, said you can play a tune of sorts with the white keys and you can play a tune of sorts with the black keys. But if you want harmony, you must play with both. Mm -hmm. And that abiding principle was something Father um, was able to sort of push through to the rest of us. And so he, he spent a year before the war, 1937, 38, he came to England uh, and got a teaching uh, um, uh, degree uh, London University and then came back again uh, during the war and spent the rest of the war uh, in Achimota um, mm. where I was born in 1944 yeah and then you were telling me before that that you had a choice of going to school at Dulwich College um, as a day yes. boy or going to Cheltenham to uh, Dean Close School and that that's was, right that your your mum and dad sent you there age 13 give it 
give us a little bit of background about that. Yeah, that's well, cool. we, we ended up in South London. Um, um, and I think that's probably because my father had spent a bit of time there uh, before the war. And my brother very quickly uh, uh, went to Dulwich. He was much brighter than me and subsequently became a lawyer. And he went to Dulwich College. <clears throat> but uh, my mother noticed that I was uh, picking up this Cockney accent and uh, not speaking <laughs> as well as I should. And she thought that if I went to Dulwich, I'd carry on uh, with my Cockney accent. Uh, and so because the family were quite used to boarding, uh, Achimoto was a boarding school. All my three sisters went to boarding schools in, in, in the Gold Coast in those days. Uh, they packed me off to, um, off to uh, Dean Close. And the story behind that was quite interesting too, because my father just happened to be sitting on the top of a clamp clump omnibus, if you like, uh, chatting to this chap who was the Reverend uh, Douglas Graham, who was the headmaster of Dean Close School. And in the conversation, they discovered that the senior Latin master of Dean Close had actually been headmaster of Achimota School. Quite an incredible coincidence. So needless to say, instead of going to Dulwich, I ended up at uh, Dean Close as a boarder uh, and thoroughly loved it, enjoyed it, really. And uh, did, I mean, you must have been the only black child uh, there uh, at the school at the time. Did, did, did you ever feel any kind of pressure, prejudice against? No, no, it was very interesting because I had a fantastic housemaster, uh, <coughs> Girling. We used to call him Scruff Girling, and he took me under his wings. And he told me many years later <coughs> that when I arrived at the school, the senior common room, um, were trying to work out what I would bring in the way of, uh, what my parents would bring in the way of pocket money. Um, how many chickens, how many ducks, that sort of thing. So <laughs> there was... <laughs> There was a sort of element of not quite knowing what this black boy, this black boy was going to do. But as I said, with the headmaster uh, who'd been a head in Achimota, in, in, in Neil, Henry Neil, uh, at the school, he knew exactly uh, what was needed and how to look after an African child. So I had a fantastic time. And, then I, and I have to say this quite honestly, and many people ask me this question uh, about prejudice and uh, did I ever feel uh, any sense of prejudice. And I can honestly say, I never did. And there's a lovely story I tell people, uh, when I was at the Middlesex, I was doing research for Leslie Lacane, uh, measuring pressures in a common barter. And Leslie said to me one day, well, you know, you need some kit uh, and synchronous cholangiomanometry, uh, measuring pressures in a common barter and doing a video of the, the whole procedure would die from the gallbladder into the combarduct and out into the duodenum. So I needed a high definition television. And he sent me off with a blank check to go to Soho and buy a television. And I went down to Soho and I got this very large uh, 21 inch screen uh, television, perfect. And was carrying it through Soho on my shoulder. You know? And as I walked through, a bobby came up and it was the usual, hello, hello, hello. What do you think you're doing, sir? <laughs> and, and so I looked him squarely in the eye and said, officer, I'm on my way to the middle sex and this is my research equipment I'm taking with me. And I think he was so flabbergasted, he didn't know how to reply and just let me go. <laughs> it's the way you say it, Roger, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely right. And then why, you went up to London to medical school. So, and, and yeah. you're, well, let's actually, before we finish on your dad, because he, yeah. he, he then became ambassador for Ghana yeah. to Ethiopia, right? Correct. And Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa, Ababa yeah. must have had some holidays down in, in oh, Addis Ababa. It was fantastic. My first holiday there when I was age 16, so it was very impressionable. And, and I well remember uh, one episode when uh, we went to uh, uh, see them. And the Ghana flag is red, yellow, and green with a black star. And the Ethiopian flag is the reverse without the black star. And so we turn up at the uh, 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 palace for Haile Selassie. Right. And Ghana had only the second Rolls Royce in the country because the uh, president, uh, the king had the first, uh, the British ambassador had the second, so we had the third. And um, Ghana had the uh, third Rolls Royce. So we turn up at the embassy in this Rolls Royce and I go with him. 
and roaming around the grounds are two lions because of course he was uh, the lion of Judah and the lions represented his kingdom. And after father had his audience, uh, I stayed in the car, I wasn't moving out. Um, they came through and we sat in the car and drove down the hill. And I was absolutely flabbergasted to see the whole line of people fall down on their knees, genuflecting. And I thought I'd arrived. I thought, gosh, <laughs> you know, this is what it is to be. A <laughs> of course, they confused the flags, but still, it, it was an unfortunate start to my life. It probably gave me, um, um, uh, put me above my station, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, it gave you, it gave you your confidence, which has yes. helped, helped you through your career. <laughs> oh, most certainly has, yes. <laughs> Well, actually, there's a question coming through from Evelyn Minsar. Thank you, Evelyn. She, she's saying just about this issue of, of uh, black uh, uh, you know, possible racism. Um, she says that uh, the, the British Academy of Management online annual conference, they stated black surgeons promoted far less than white colleagues in England. I mean, do you... Uh, do yeah, you I, think... saw that, 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 I saw that piece, Evelyn, uh, and Mensa is a, a Ghanaian name, so I, I assume you are. I saw that uh, report, I think it came out this morning, didn't it? Uh, yeah. Suggesting that there were still uh, disparities between black. Uh, it didn't differentiate because whenever the studies are done, for example, on A-level results and so forth, uh, you will see that there is a differentiation between achievements, Chinese always top of the, the list, uh, even ahead of white children. Uh, and at the bottom of the list tends to be uh, black people. But if you actually differentiate between the black people, there's a difference between black Caribbeans and black Africans. So sometimes one can overgeneralize. But yes, I, I, I take the point of what she's making, uh, the point she's making, that there appears to be a difference, which clearly yeah. needs to be uh, looked at and, and sorted. She just replied, actually, she said the paper's under review, peer review at the moment. So she's asking for the data. But I mean, maybe, maybe you can keep us updated on that. I mean, I, uh, we'll skip a, about a bit and then we'll go back to the yeah, yeah. next because that's where you and I first met. But uh, yeah. I mean, just continuing this issue of, of racism and, and, and the, your job in the House of Lords, weren't you involved in looking at the question of Black Lives Matter and the the um, statue issue of Edward Colston in um, in Bristol and so on, Bernie. Yeah, very much so. And and I I, I spoke uh, uh, in the Lords on, on this because if you remember, there was that terrible uh, scenes of people uh, taking down the statue of Colston and chucking it into the uh, uh, canal in Bristol. Uh, and and I was struck by uh, a letter by a chap called Sir Geoffrey Palmer. Uh, who's Scotland's first uh, black professor. I think he's an emeritus professor now. And he said, don't take down statues, take down racism. And I thought that was a very powerful statement. And the reason I thought it was powerful and I made the comments in my speech is that going back to Ghana, uh, Ghana was a British colony and Cape Coast was the very place where the slaves left to go to uh, the Americas. And one of the castles is called Elmina. And if you ever go around uh, Cape Coast Castle, you must go to Elmina Castle because it really is quite um, a sight. And there's a door in the wall of the castle, very slim, so only one person can go through it. And that door was called the door of no return. And that's where the slaves would be taken from their dungeons through the wall into the ships and off. And you know, in the same town, Cape Coast, there's a statue of Queen Victoria right. in Queen Victoria Park. And that statue was never taken down by the Ghanaians. Nobody has ever thought to get rid of it because it's part of the country's heritage. And I think the lesson to be learned from that is that pulling down statues doesn't do any good at all. What you need to do is educate people. You need to give people the background and the context of why things happen. Yeah. So that was what I, I just felt moved to to say that in in, in my speech in in the Lords. No, uh, well, I, you know, I I've been to that slave castle. Like, it's the most fantastic. Uh, it's a UNESCO site, isn't it? Yes, World it is. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I really recommend people visit it. But it is it is uh, 
uh, absolutely terrible all went on. And I, I well, seen... it's extraordinary when you think it was built in 1492. Uh, and the Portuguese, of course, were the first people there. Uh, and so <laughs> I have to take some uh, comfort in the fact that uh, my, my, on my father's side, uh, my great great grandfather was a Portuguese chap. Um, uh, and so, you know, we, we have got that uh, in, in our uh, lineage. Um, I suppose but, that's where the name Ribeiro comes from. Well, that's the way the name Ribeiro comes from. Uh, yeah, and yeah. in fact, my, my serendipity uh, is a strange thing uh, because one of the things, Roger, that happened uh, when I was uh, president at Lincoln's, Inn, uh, at Lincoln's Inn, I looked across the square at Lincoln's Inn and I remember um, getting a correspondence from somebody who was telling me about slavery and, 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 and said that my relatives came from Brazil. And I wrote back and said, no, 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 they came from Portugal. But when I did a bit more research about it, like, what was very interesting is that my great, uh, uh, my grandfather uh, actually came to uh, Lincoln's Inn to study in 1895 uh, law. And his brother followed in 1902 to do the same thing. So there was I sitting in the College of Surgeons, the president of the college, looking across Lincoln's Inn, and then stones throw away uh, was where my, you know, grandfather had been as, as a law student. So there are a lot of connections, and I, I, I therefore feel that um, you know people have to recognise that there is a history about Africa. Uh, which goes back a long way. And it isn't all colored by slavery or, 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 or that, but there is a, an awful lot of uh, learning that's gone, gone through over the years. Yeah. Let, let's go back to your days at the Middlesex where we first right. met. And I mean, you, you came up to medical school and then you stayed on, you must've done your house jobs uh, at the Middlesex. Then you, I, where we met was at the central Middlesex back in- the well, That's right, yeah. I started probably. actually with somebody you would know well, uh, I started actually as a house officer, house surgeon, to Richard Turner Warwick. Right. And uh, Richard, uh, for those who don't know, was an amazing uh, urological surgeon. He was actually a very well-trained general surgeon. And um, he had this um, habit of making sure, probably because he would go to international meetings and, and boast about uh, what, he, what uh, he taught people, but he, he insisted that his houseman uh, would be able to do an nephrectomy using his super 12 incision. You remember going over the 12th rib yep. and opening up access to the kidney. Yep. And so I ended up doing two nephrectomies while I was a house officer in Middlesex, supervised. And, um, you know, he was able to go to the RSM or wherever it is meeting afterwards and say, it's a very easy incision, this, you know, even the houseman can do it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Richard Turner. But, and then... <laughs> then you, you were, uh, I think, a senior registrar at um, the Central Middlesex, weren't you? With yeah, uh, I was. Yeah, I was. I was a registrar at, at Central uh, first of all. Then I went back as a senior registrar uh, at Central Middlesex uh, in colorectal surgery, and then um, uh, and worked also not directly uh, with, um, with 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 the um, um, colorectal so with the. Um, Peter Gummer, who was yeah. an upper, who was more an upper GI surgeon, if you remember, Peter. Yeah. Peter Riddle. Uh, Peter Riddle. Peter Riddle was the urologist. I worked, yeah. with, I worked with Peter as well. But yeah. I worked with Peter earlier on when I was a house, when I was a registrar. Right. But when I went back to uh, um, as a senior registrar, I worked for Frank Henley. Do you remember Frank um, Henley? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I worked for Frank Henley, first of all. Um, and uh, you know, the classic thing about Frank is that. He, would, he used to live in ross on -Y, and he would get up and leave at about five o'clock in the morning and drive down to the uh, centre of Middlesex. Uh, and he would pitch up at six o'clock wanting to do a ward round. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, this is, this is a bit much, really. And, and the reason was he would get his day's work done starting at six o'clock, and, and by 12 o'clock he was done and gone. <laughs> drive all the way back to Ross on Wye. <laughs> well, I think he stayed at his club and did some other things, you know. But, but that was, so I, I worked for, yeah, so, so basically I was a central with Frank uh, Henley and then uh, I went back to the Middlesex and, and worked with uh, Chris Russell, right. um, who was a superb um, surgeon, uh, fantastic biliary surgeon. 
and, and, and also with Willie Slack. Remember Willie Slack? Yeah, 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 dean, yeah. dean of the Middlesex and uh, a colorectal surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, so both those people encouraged me uh, you know, during my time in the Middlesex. And it was there uh, in, in 78 that I, I got my, um, I was appointed a consultant to, um, to, to Basildon. I wanted to ask you, Bernie, about Basildon and about the introduction of laparoscopy in the 1990s, because yeah. um, the, yeah. the, uh, that Tim, you know, I was doing urology then, but I remember yeah. there were there was quite a lot of adverse publicity about complications of particularly gallbladder surgery, but laparoscopy in general. Um, there was. Tim, tell us a little bit about that and, and yeah. the, the background to it. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, basically learned my laparoscopic skills uh, because uh, I um, had a colleague who used a camera doing his ENT work. And because I was doing urology, I was fascinated to, and I used to get a crick in the neck. You know, when we did cystoscopies, you were always getting a neck ache uh, looking uh, up, the, um, up, up the telescope. So the idea of having a camera at the end of my scope rather, rather appealed. And I learned how to work off a screen doing urology. And so when um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy came in uh, and became the norm, I felt that I already had the skills. And uh, I, I, I went off this course, uh, which uh, was organized um, in, in Missouri by Joe Peatland. And Joe Peatland had come over from uh, Kansas, Missouri in, in 1991 to demonstrate procedure at St. Mary's. I think David Rosen organized it. And a lot of surgeons turned up to see this being done. The first lap coli had actually been done in Edinburgh under Kashiri's uh, um, 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 uh, auspices. And so once this course was over, I then rang up Mike Bailey and I said, look, Mike, you know, I, I, I'd like to um, see how to do this. Uh, and I'd been to the States and I'd, I'd done a few sessions um, um, there. And so Mike very kindly came over. I had a private patient who I went up to and said, look, you know, um, <clears throat> this old operation of open cholecystectomy is passe, they now do it by keyhole surgery. Would you like to be a guinea pig? And bless her, she said, yes. Uh, and I said, well, I'm getting a surgeon in who's going to assist me to do this. And Mike Bailey came over all the way from Guildford and we sat down and he just assisted me, took me through it. And there was my first lap coli, went perfectly. And um, you know, I've been grateful to him ever since. I and mean, we're, we're, he and I were, were uh, casualty officers of the Middlesex uh, in the seventies, anyway. So we go back a long way. I think you know some of our viewers won't won't know that one of the big risks of, of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, well, open actually as well, is, is yes. injury to the common bile duct, isn't it? Correct. It's Correct. Pretty. I mean, you you can die if somebody injures your common bile. Absolutely. Duct. And, and this was a serious complaint because you know. Surgeons are often accused of the maxim, see one, do one, teach one. Uh, and a lot of people had literally been to a course, um, as I had done, uh, and then thought that they could do this operation. Uh, and and, and it, it really was cowboy country to start with. And during this time when we were getting evidence of increasing uh, cases of bar duct injury, um, I was secretary of the Association of Surgeons, and um, I was asked to do a, a, a national survey of, of these uh, injuries. And so we set up a register and we, we um, asked the fellows to submit their cases, uh, and quite a lot of them came in. And it was quite obvious that this was a problem, uh, and, and therefore there needed to be a proper training process. And if you remember, um, the College of Surgeons um, set up units, uh, recognized units for laparoscopic surgery in Leeds with Mike McMahon, in Guildford with Mike Bailey, and in uh, um, Kings. Uh, I'm trying to remember who the, they had an Irishman who, who actually set up the uh, service of Kings, but he went back subsequently. And I've, I've just forgotten his name just now. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it was necessary to actually bring people to heal and make sure that they went through a proper process of instruction uh, before they started this operation, because it wasn't like open cholecystectomy. Uh, there were issues of orientation. The one advantage 
that a lab clearly has over, for example, doing a radical nephrectomy laparoscopically or, or something like that, is that you've got a backdrop. You know, you've got a you've got the liver as your backdrop. But equally, uh, depth perception can be a problem. And if you haven't got the depth perception wrong, uh, you may go further than you think when you uh, are, are trying to divide uh, tissues. Yeah. And um, I mean, I was going to ask you then, because you're, you're a very political surgeon. You're probably actually the most political of all the Ooh, surgeons. I, know that. I know. I mean, you don't get to be uh, uh, elevated to the House of Lords unless you're quite political. But what what was it that got you interested in, in the Association of Surgeons and the Royal College of Surgeons? Was it that, you know, regulation of surgery or was it the, the camaraderie? What what what? Well, it's a lot of extra work, isn't it? You, yes, you're... it is a lot of extra work. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, <clears throat> initially, one of the things that I felt was that surgeons in district general hospitals didn't quite get the same uh, recognition as those in teaching hospitals in London. And we <clears throat> did a survey, um, which the Association of Surgeons published some years later, of just how many uh, general surgeons there were uh, in, in, in hospitals uh, around London and, and North East Thames. And it, it was really quite worrying that the, the, the numbers did not match up as they should do. And on the basis of that, I, 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 I presented that data uh, at the College of Surgeons and probably it was one of the things that uh, uh, got me involved with the Associate, Association of Surgeons in the first place, obviously caught somebody's eye. Uh, and in 1995, uh, uh, I was appointed secretary of ASGBI, which I did for five years and had a fantastic time. So, you know, I think that um, my interest in data and data collection uh, started at that time. Um, and I was also very keen that surgeons should audit their work. Uh, and, and I think laparoscopic surgery and the disaster Silverman, do you remember the case of Silverman? No, she was tell, us, tell us about that. Well, she was the lady that prompted the whole thing. She she went in to have a gynecological operation done at a private hospital, uh, no names, no pack drill. And um, during the surgery, uh, the um, <clears throat> surgeon decided he wanted to do it laparoscopic. Sorry, during the surgery, uh, all went well, but subsequently she developed intestinal obstruction. And in, instead of doing an open operation to deal with the, what were almost certainly an adhesive band, um, the surgeon had a trainee who said, look, we can do this laparoscopically. I, I've done quite a lot of this, let's, let's do it laparoscopically. And persuaded against his will, he, he allowed this procedure to be done. And um, unfortunately, the small bowel was perforated. Uh, and despite um, a surgeon coming in from um, St. Mark's, uh, the patient died. And the husband um, uh, had um, strong connections with the press and newspapers, I think it was the Daily Express, I can't remember which. And he started this big campaign uh, um, about surgeons doing outrageous operations and, and, and creating havoc. And it, that was the real catalyst uh, for the survey we did on, on, on lap coles. Um, and, and then from there, David Dunn, remember? David yeah, yeah, I remember David Cambridge. Cambridge. Yeah, 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 well, David was one of the early uh, protagonists and, and did one of the first college audits. He, 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 they called it Dunfile, I think it was. And he was one who, who started sort of uh, ensuring that people would record their cases, uh, whatever it was. And then uh, I did one with the association that I mentioned earlier. Do you think surgery is safer now than it, than it was back in the 1990s? I think it, it is much safer. I think we all have to admit, Roger, and you were part of the training program uh, and a consultant as well, that many of our bosses in the old days uh, did have a view that cases that came in in the middle of the night, <laughs> I say it, uh, should be handled by the registrar or senior registrar. And, and getting a consultant to come in in the middle of the night was you know, quite a thing. Um, I, I well remember, um, and I had some super bosses when I was a registrar, but, you know, you had to justify uh, why this person had to come in to do the case. And, and in Basildon, where I was, the consultants were often on call 
at three hospitals, Billericay, Orsett, and Basildon, and, and things could blow up at any, any hospital. So I think that what has changed is that the emphasis on consultants taking responsibility for patients and actually being there uh, is important. In the States, as you know, uh, and I've, I've been to states several times, um, uh, a Secretary of Association, uh, and, and, and being with some marvelous people. But in the States, as you know, you don't get your money unless you, you, you the attendee, do the case. <laughs> and a couple of comments I wanted to add. There's, there's uh, Ek, uh, Ekeni Agben has, has sent a thing on behalf of Osita Agben. He says he was on the same boat as you. Um, oh, really? The apartment? Yeah. In, se <laughs> <laughs> in September 1952, and he sends, oh, his, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> he sends his best wishes. Um, yeah. And then Sheila Hollins says, lovely to hear about your early oh, career. Sheila, yeah. 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 Uh, how important have you found an understanding of mental health to surgical practice? Oh, uh, huge. I mean, Sheila, bless you, um, was one of those people who made sure, as bog standard surgeons, actually understood issues of mental health. And, and she has tutored me on that on more than one occasion in the house. Uh, and she's an, an admirable colleague. I think, you know, we're all recognizing now uh, through this pandemic, um, you can't go anywhere without somebody saying, look, the devastating effect of isolation uh, during this pandemic and, and what it has done for people's mental health. And I think where there's a much more, a much greater awareness of the problems of mental health now than there ever used to be. So, you know, I take my hat off to all psychiatrists and, and, and those who, psychologists who, who uh, have been trying to raise the profile on this. Yeah, including our former president, Sir Simon. Including our former president, yeah. <laughs> yeah, David, Co David Cochran says, will future innovations be stifled by ever increasing regulation? That's an interesting question. It is an interesting question, and I fear he's right. But on the other hand, I mean, like all, I mean, I think the difference is that research, as you and I used to do it, uh, and I had a fantastic boss in Leslie Lecain, who uh, uh, I mentioned earlier on. Um, all you had to do really was clear it with the ethics committee, clear it with your boss, and then you got on with it. Uh, but now research uh, clearly um, it has a much more national focus. Um, and there's much more regulation than there was. But I think if you can demonstrate the benefits to patients of the research you plan to undertake, then there really ought not to be any barriers. So yes, uh, I would recognize that there are many hoops that people have to go through, but the patient safety lobby is a very important one. And if you talk to any of the lawyers, um, you know, medical litigation is not getting any less and, and the money for it um, that uh, to pay for it is is forever going up, and, and, you know. So doctors have to be, uh, I think, protected in in this area. Yeah, yeah, and and then the college does a a good job in 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 its regulatory function. So a couple more questions. One from Russell Lott. Thank you, Russell. Oh, Russell. Hi. Yeah. Currently, the ASGBI is still has a commitment to teaching in sub-Saharan Africa and sends funds yeah. to help. Do you have any advice about how we might deliver? this in the current situation? I mean, with COVID now, the situation must be worse probably than- uh, Yeah, with COVID it's, it's much, much worse. I mean, <clears throat> I, I get some feedback of, of what's happening in Africa. Interesting enough, everybody thought Sub-Saharan Africa would suffer badly with coronavirus and it would wipe them out. Uh, although the incident, and I, keep, I kept a pretty close eye on what the rate is in, in Ghana. All my family practically had, had coronavirus. Um, uh, but they have all been vaccinated and thank goodness they're all well. But uh, what is interesting is, is that I think we don't do enough in our training to encourage trainees to go overseas. And I think this is something that DFID and the Foreign Office should be doing much more to support uh, British trainees to go overseas and gain experience of working there. And at the moment, a lot of it is done on a voluntary basis uh, and, and the association of surgeons and others and the college too uh, tries to get um, grants to let people go. But I think the experience that one can get from working overseas is huge. 
uh, and we should be doing more to encourage people and, and find the funding for that to happen. Perhaps that's a cause I should be taking up in the house, uh, Roger. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Guled Jama says, on reflection, what personal attributes do you see as having been influential in your successful career as a surgeon, particularly in the context of being a surgeon of colour in the UK? That's an interesting question. It is an interesting question. First of all, disregard the colour. Yeah. I think that can be a stigma and, 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 and something that holds you down rather than uh, allows you to flourish. Um, and, and, you know, back, back to my, my comments uh, that I made earlier on. I, I think that the, the most important thing for me uh, is that I had a good education. Uh, and I think it's, and for many people of color in the UK, unless they're born here, most of the education perhaps will be overseas. They will have difficulties uh, in understanding the way the Brits work and, and, and attitudes and so forth. So you do have an advantage if you spend many, many of your years in this country before you embark on a medical career and so forth. Um, having said that, of course, there is um, racism. I referred to it earlier. Uh, and a lot of it may be uh, under the counter and a lot of it may be quiet and unspoken. Uh, but, you know, I can honestly say, Roger, every single job I went for, and there were some I didn't get, um, it's like that golfer, uh, Walter Hagen, who used to go onto the first tee of a, a golf competition, and he would say, right, chaps, who's coming second? You've mm. got to go into an interview, whatever your colour or your race or whatever it is, saying, why should I not get this job? Yeah. Not, I'm not going to get this job because, you know, it's written. So I think attitude is one thing. Um, um, experience is the other. And clearly, you've got to have the support of your bosses uh, and, and keeping in touch. And again, this is something many people don't do after they've done jobs. They don't keep the contacts with their bosses. I mean, I used to, you know, I went and saw Turner Warwick in, in his nursing home just before he died. I kept in touch with that guy all the way through. He was a fantastic mentor. Yeah. And, and I did the same, you know, kept in touch with all my bosses. And I think I'd like to think my trainees feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> if you, one or two out there who might disagree. But uh, in fact, I played golf with one of them just the other day. So <laughs> I think I think you are, Bernie. I mean, this this uh, I think you're you're an inspiration to you show you show what can be done and, and we we definitely need to, to to work harder and I think you know we were talking earlier about Neil Matenson's brave decision to get yeah. Helen Kennedy in and yeah. she was talking on this show a few weeks ago to, yeah. to do that to look at the college structure and to ask the question about gender equality, of course, yeah. which is another big issue. We've, we've talked about that too. Yeah. You yeah. Are, you're, you're a shining light to us to show that you can get to the very top of the surgery um, as, well, a, as a black man. It's good. Yeah. I mean, one of the things is that uh, I sat on that commission with Avril Mansfield. We were the two sort of um, snowheads and blackheads. Well, two, both were snowheads, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> But um, one of the things that I, I, I felt sitting on, on, on that committee uh, was that the premise for the inquiry was that the college had suddenly become all male and all white. And my riposte to the younger members on that committee was, yeah, that's the situation now. But, you know, 15 years ago, actually, we had a black president. Mm. Uh, and it's about getting the person onto council. And once you've made that progression and, and making people feel that there's no way that they can be uh, prevented from getting on the council. You don't get onto something if you don't apply for it. Yeah. yeah. I know I'm, I will get brickbacks from many people saying, oh, but I applied several times and didn't get there. Well, you know, keep going. Yeah. OK, there's a question from Michael Crumplin about what are your oh, feelings? Mate. Yeah. Uh, what about what are your feelings about surgical staffing levels in the UK, bearing in mind the significant backlog of cases? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a, a big issue. I mean, uh, um, if you go back to the Bristol uh, heart surgery thing, one of the problems there was the number of surgeons per, per unit. And, and one of the recommendations of our report was that there should be a minimum of four 
uh, cardiac surgeons per unit. Well, you know, since that report went out, it's 10 years ago now, I was looking the other day, and already there is evidence of uh, shortages in cardiothoracic surgery, um, partly, I suppose, because of Brexit and so forth and people going. So I think staffing levels is an incredibly uh, difficult issue and that we've, something that we've got to constantly keep, keep in mind. Uh, Mick, I know, would be um, particularly interested in that. Uh, he was in Wrexham and ran a very good unit there. Uh, and, and, and someone who, you know, would be concerned about how we uh, overcome the issues of re recruitment in surgery. I think one of the things we have to accept, uh, and it reminds me rather of Sir Lancelot Spratt, uh, do you remember uh, when he said, uh, uh, to be a surgeon, you need the, hand, you need the heart of a lion, uh, the, the, the eyes of a hawk, and the hands of a lady. <laughs> I think... One of the things that we try to do at the college, and Avril uh, has really been the principal leader in that, in her position as president of WIST or WINS, is promoting women surgeons, getting more and more women come into surgery. And I think the percentages are changing, but still not enough. <laughs> uh, Bibian Othegbu says, well done to you, sir, for being a great role model, which is, uh, I, I totally agree with Thank that. You. One thing I wanted to talk about, Bernie, is when you were president 2000 of the college, World College of yeah. Surgeons, 2005, 2008, that was when the issue of me modernizing medical careers was, yeah. uh, and it, it must have been troubling for you. And it, I think there were a lot of young, uh, younger trainee doctors who were quite badly affected by that, by the, the you know, the, the problems with the interviews and the posts, and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that must I mean, it was. Yeah. What lessons it, it, can we learn from that? Well, I think, again, the lessons I think one needs to learn is that when you go into organizing selection by computing, by computers, which is what happened uh, effectively, and many trainees who had done research, who had uh, other skills, were given you know, one point for doing an academic research thesis, etc. Uh, and, and, and the whole algorithm for selection, frankly, did not uh, hold up uh, against a face-to-face -face interview, which is what we had done before. And I think the point is the deaneries were challenged by the number of people who were trying to go from basic surgical training to higher surgical training. And this was seen as a way of a route for allowing a transmission. In your specialty in urology, you'll remember um, uh, David Mundy and others were very much proponents for the run-through training scheme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and which didn't suit me, and I wasn't a, a supporter of that. I felt that there, were, there needed to be a selection gate between um, SHO and, and specialist training. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the process caused a lot of heartache. And uh, Neil Douglas uh, did a review afterwards, and I joined that review to, to see how we might possibly reverse some of the problems that have happened uh, with MMC, MTAS. Um, I have to say, um, we never came to a, um, well, I didn't think it was a satisfactory conclusion uh, of, of the things that were done. And um, I actually pulled out of that. And, and you know, we surveyed our college members um, who majority, 78%, felt that the whole thing should be pulled, the plug should be pulled and we should start again. So it was an, an, an unfortunate chapter. Um, and um, didn't we end up with a march between the College of Physicians and the College of Surgeons protesting about the whole thing? Yeah. I seem to, seem to remember that image. So it wasn't, one of my, it wasn't one of my glorious shining periods in representing the profession. Um, but I think at the end, um, I made a rather hollow gesture of, of walking out of it because I didn't feel that we were ever going to get it right. Yeah. But, you know, funny enough, so many years on, the whole program has been looked at again, isn't it? Yeah. It's gone through two reviews, so many other different reviews, uh, and, and, and we don't hear many people complaining about the present system we have. So hopefully we've got something right. Yeah, no, I think it took, it took a long time for... Uh, there's still, I think, people out there with scar bearing scars from it all, but, um, yeah, yeah. it's settled yeah. down. Let, yeah. 
But when I watch the news at 10 tonight, doubtless um, Lise Doucette will be uh, broadcasting from Afghanistan, Bernie. Yes. You've had, you've had some experience out there in Afghanistan, is that right? In the Helmand I did. Yeah, I did. And, and it was fascinating uh, on, on, on two fronts. One, um, we had uh, the beginning of the military um, uh, operational surgical training course at the College of Surgeons, the old college before the new one. Uh, which was run by people like David Knott. Remember David Knott? David Knott had actually served, he, uh, he was wing commander in the RAF. He'd actually served uh, in Syria and in, in uh, Afghanistan, uh, often going incognito. And he had run the definitive surgical trauma skills workshop at the college. And the most course was a superb um, course for military surgeons before they were deployed to uh, Afghanistan. Um, and so I was um, asked when I joined the House of Lords uh, in 2012, 2011, sorry, uh, if I'd be interested in joining a parliamentary uh, group, um, four peers and 25 MPs and, and um, others from the MOD uh, to fly over to Camp Bastion. Um, we went over uh, in November, I remember, um, 18th of November. We spent three days there. Um, much of it was to sort of see how um, um, things like, you know, IEDs were deployed, what um, uh, tactics were used. But I was interested in going to the hospital. I wanted to see the hospital at Camp Bastion. Now, I remember initially in the first uh, uh, round of campaigns in 2005 or six, when I was at the college, and the course was being run, much of the Bastion Hospital was tented. It was under a big uh, marquee type tent with, with different specialties coming off it. And, 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 and the surgeons worked in incredibly difficult uh, conditions. When I arrived in 2011, they had a brand new hospital that they built with two wards and, and uh, three th uh, theaters and, and ITU. Um, they had to separate off in the men's ward the insurgents from the uh, troops, because as you can imagine, <clears throat> um, there was a lot of suspicion about uh, attitudes of, of the insurgents. And I was very lucky, with, we call it lucky or serendipity, but um, while I was there, uh, a helicopter came in uh, bearing the, the MERT team, they call it, military evacuation, uh, rapid transfer team, uh, brought this uh, Afghani uh, person uh, who was an insurgent, who had been shot in the chest and, and in the groin. And in an instant, which is quite unbelievable, in an instant, this chap went through a &E, X-ray, CT scan on the operating table in a matter of minutes. And the thing that was really impressive and a lesson to us in the UK is that there was a chef de service. There was a military man who was the conductor of the orchestra. Nothing happened until he was sure that the anesthetists got the patients organized, uh, the bloods were available. And we had this machine, this wonderful machine called the uh, Rotem, uh, which was, um, I think I mentioned to you before, this uh, lovely girl called uh, um, Catherine Doran, who'd done some research in uh, Portland Down uh, on trauma to uh, uh, um, um, limbs and things and how to deal with the hyper the coagulability state uh, that would, would uh, develop. And so this patient was brought in, um, uh, the um, <clears throat> Rotem was fired off. And if you got a wine glass, you knew that your clotting state was, was, was okay. If you got a, a, a champagne flute, then you had a problem. And you had then had to have the, the sort of replacement therapy uh, in terms of uh, fresh frozen plasma clotting agents and all those things. And um, the impressive thing, as I said, is that there were four surgeons present, two Americans uh, and two Brits, uh, all of different discipline. And, and they all got together and, and sorted this patient out. Yeah. And, and that was an example of, you know, Americans, British collaboration, uh, working, and many of the uh, British people there were volunteer volunteer staff from DGS hospitals. Yeah, Bernie, tell us that you, you tell us about the telephone call that you received from David Cameron. <laughs> yes, that's amusing. 
Well, I, I, I was with our travel club, the Surgical 60 Club is called, and uh, we had a, a meeting in Winchester and we were going around the military museum uh, in Winchester when suddenly my phone went. And um, <clears throat> you know how it is that uh, you sometimes get caught off guard. And it was like a, a scene from Yes Minister because I said, Yes, Prime Minister. And of course, all these eyes turned around and looked at me as I <laughs> bolted off to find a quiet place to have a conversation. And that's when uh, David said, look, you know, uh, Andrew Lansley was... Uh, because what happened, uh, just before uh, the end of my presidency, um, they had wanted, in opposition, this was in 2008, they had wanted to um, 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 give a, a talk about what they would do when they came into government. And, and on the health issue, they chose the college uh, somewhere to come and give this uh, talk. And David obviously had remembered that. And in, in, in 2010, uh, this phone call came through and he said, would you like to go to the House of Lords and help uh, us with our health, our, um, you know, health agenda when we, when we uh, get into government? Which, of course, they were then. Did they ask you whether you were a member of the Conservative Party? <laughs> yes. Well, one of the things that was slightly embarrassing is that I had to say to him on this phone call, I said, David, there's just one thing you need to know. And he said, what's that? I said, I'm not a member of the Conservative Party. <laughs> and he said, well, don't worry. Uh, I'm sure you'll change your mind when you come in. <laughs> uh, Ten years down the road, I sit on the benches. I hope my chief whip is not listening. I sit on the benches, but I'm still not a signed up card carrying Tory. But uh, I support many of their ideals. But I, 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 and the reason for that, is it, it may sound a bit strange, this Roger, but my father, you see, was an ambassador, as I said, um, to, to many countries, United States with uh, JFK and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And when uh, the coup happened in Ghana uh, and Nkrumah was overthrown, all the ambassadors of Ghana around the world were recalled. And everybody who was a member of the party was sacked. Only two people kept their jobs. One of them was my father because he never joined the party. And I'm afraid I learned that lesson. And um, I don't know if I'm gonna be sacked at some point, but uh, I didn't feel the need to join the party just to get into the House of Lords. We're sort of running out of time. We've got six minutes left, Bernie. But um, I think one of the things you've done in the House of Lords, I'm sure you've done loads of things, but the one I know about is banning smoking in cars for, for people with children. I mean, that sounds like a, a really good thing to do. Do you think, is that one of your prouder moments? You had lots yeah, of yeah, 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 it is, because, you know, um, I think one of the things that you can't do any surgery in the house as such. You can talk about surgery until the cars come home, but... On the other hand, I would prefer to leave that to those who are the coalface. But you can do something about some of the social problems that affect us, that affect our healthcare. And I felt very passionately that uh, this whole issue of secondhand smoke uh, was something that needed to be handled. A child in the car seat at the back of a car while the parents in front are smoking with the windows shut is getting an intolerable amount of smoke uh, into their lungs which will do lasting damage. And, and on the basis of that, I, 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 with the British Lung Foundation and a few others, we set up this campaign to try and um, bring in some legislation. So as, as a peer, you have the ability to bring in a private member's bill. Uh, and so I introduced a private member's bill on banning smoking cars for children pre present. Um, it had failed in the House of Commons uh, needed to say it passed in our house, but failed in the House of Commons again. Um, and so one was getting a little bit desperate uh, with that. And then a new bill came in, the Children and Families Act. Um, and we were able to squirrel that in with the help of uh, uh, some Labour members, um, uh, which was you know, made a, a big difference. Uh, and eventually that, that bill went through. Uh, and I'm proud of it because you know, children are precious to all of us. And you shouldn't have unthinking adults carry out practices which will damage a child for life. I mean, long-standing asthma, all these sort of things that can happen from smoking in confined spaces. And I think it was, it was irresponsible of people to do so. And I'm glad that we have had a, 
an act that actually prevents them from doing that. And then there was the medical devices bill, wouldn't you and Elora Finlay were? Yes, uh, this, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes uh, briefly, uh, briefly uh, Bernie, because we're running brief, out of time. Okay. Uh, again, Lord Hunt, who was responsible for getting that bill on smoking through the second time round, Elora Finlay, uh, myself, and, and um, Lord, um, um, oh, um, was a cricketer of Liverpool. They'll come back to me. Anyway. Uh, and essentially, we were concerned about the Chinese government's uh, treatment of the Ouijas uh, and the Falun Gong and, and, and other uh, faith groups and the way they were incarcerated uh, in their camps. Uh, and so um, we felt that uh, we should bring in this amendment to prevent certain medical uh, equipment, etc., uh, being exported out to. China, which could be used in these practices. And I'm pleased to say the minister accepted our, uh, uh, David Alton uh, is the name I was trying to remember. Uh, the minister uh, accepted our, our uh, uh, amendment and put their name to it. So, so that passed. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I, we're getting close to, to finishing time, but um, let me, uh, a question from John Broadfield. Uh, oh, he, John. Yeah. <laughs> John saying, what, what stood out for you as the most significant value from your time as a medical student at the Middlesex? I think that's interesting. But... John, is being with you as a student. <laughs> John, <laughs> John and I were, were both students at Middlesex. He was a fantastic uh, footballer and played uh, uh, for the hospital and probably the United Hospitals as well. Uh, but I, I think as students, um, what we enjoyed the most and what stood out is the support we had from people like uh, Eric Walls, who's a professor of, of anatomy. Uh, and Eric Walls, I well remember uh, at Twickenham for the rugby club. Here was this literally one man and a dog on a touchline, nobody else there at all. And he would come week after week to support the, uh, the team. And it's that sort of dedication from, from, from people that I, I, I remember. Um, from the little six, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was a fantastic place. So you've got four children and eight grandchildren. I mean, you, what are your proudest achievements, Bernie? Is it being um, a member of the House of Lords? Is it being a successful surgeon, a president of the college? Is it being a dad with four kids? What tell us? What are you most proud of? Well, I think one is always very proud when your children achieve something. Uh, and, 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 you know, and I'm pleased to say all four of mine uh, have been able to have a profession of their own, stand on their own two feet. Obviously, the girls, my daughter's all child rearing. Uh, one of them's recently gone back to uh, part time working. One of them but, is a uh, strictly, strictly come dancing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. One of my daughters, Joanna, one of the twins, uh, for a good period of time. Uh, was a fourth floor manager for Strictly Come Dancing. So uh, <laughs> yeah. she met quite a few of the celebrities uh, yeah, on that program. Yeah, great training, I think. Um, but I think one of my, my son, I'm particularly pleased uh, because he's now um, a headmaster of Bradford Grammar School, the junior section, Bradford Grammar School in Yorkshire. And um, that just sort of carries on the teaching profession uh, which my father had, and I feel rather proud. That, you know, one of one of the kids would have picked that up. <laughs> that's it. That's your clock uh, there. Uh, yeah, chime, chiming eight o'clock, which reminds me we better. We like to finish on time rather than yeah. uh, go over time. Bernie, thank you so much. I mean, we've oh, we, yeah. we could have talked for another hour or so about well, uh, so many interesting things, but don't go away because I've got a couple of announcements to make tomorrow. Okay. Um, I've got another, um, it's me chairing again. I'm ha having to do a lot at the moment because um, a lot of people are away. So we've got Professor Callum Semple, who is a uh, professor of paediatric respiratory medicine in Liverpool at the Alder Hay. And he's published a rather important uh, report. He's a member of SAGE uh, and he's uh, published in the Lancet a report about um, uh, COVID. So we'll be talking about his 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 very interesting career and uh, another Middlesex person, actually, interestingly. Um, and then next week, we've got another Lord uh, here. We've got David Pryor, uh, Lord Pryor, uh, who is going to be um, interviewed, not by me, but by Richard Murley, one of our trustees. That should be interesting. And the week after that, we've got an extended session on vaccination. So um, please 
uh, those of you who feel generous, do make a donation to the Royal Society of Medicine, because as I keep saying, we've been under the cosh with our building closed. And uh, I'm sure like the Royal College of Surgeons that we're short of money for the educational activities that we do. We really love doing these webinars and we love uh, the idea that hopefully we'll be able to get back uh, in the building and have some in-person meetings. I'll be asking uh, Professor Semple tomorrow what, with his crystal ball, what he thinks, whether there's going to be a fourth wave of this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, I hope, we hope there isn't, but maybe maybe there will. Who knows? But Bernie, I will let you go and have a glass of wine now to celebrate a very successful interview. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you to all our visitors and uh, viewers. Uh, and don't forget, you can become a member of the at Royal Society of Medicine. If you're not already a member, do consider joining because we'd love to have you as part of our team, part of our family. Good night, everybody. Good night, Roger. Thank you. <laughs>